The room buzzes with chatter and toasts as a group of handsome gents, dressed to the nines in their dapper suits and pricey shoes, make their way from this foray to the next, a ritzy gentleman's club. The ladies, flaunting an 80s Queen Elizabeth vibe, add an extra dash of elegance to the scene. Despite the night's festivities, you'd expect these guys to be wiped out, maybe even a tad tipsy. But the night is still young for our tall, handsome blonde, who's got one more stop on his party itinerary, a gambling house. His dark-haired buddy tries to talk him out of it, but Lucas von Ewald, the red-haired stunner and only son of Count Ewald, vice-chancellor of the House of Lords of Burked Empire, tells him to chill and enjoy the moment. Surprisingly, the gambling house appears almost deserted, which isn't exactly what they had in mind for their nightcap. But the raven-haired Eric Faber, eldest son of the steel industry giant Faber household, has a hunch that the real fun is just about to start. He encourages the guys to roll with it. As they step inside, they find tables topped with cards and eager players hoping to hit the jackpot. Not so empty after all, huh? A chaperone spots them and happily welcomes them, expressing his concern for our blondie to Lucas. Lucas takes the cue to introduce his blonde friend, telling tales of his recent chaotic exploits that have made headlines and his triumphant victory in naval warfare. He then introduces the blondie as Captain Bastian Klovitz, the Empire's hero, and the room goes silent. The chaperone, totally gobsmacked, thanks the captain and leads them to a suite on the second floor. As they follow, Bastion warns Lucas about his over-the-top introductions, but Lucas just shrugs it off, claiming he's just bragging about his pal. Just then, a man known around town as the Beggar Duke, stumbles into the room and drops to his knees. He's pleading with his boss for another shot at the gaming table, rambling on about the stakes he's yet to throw down. His boss rolls his eyes but asks what's up for grabs anyway. The Duke, desperate and defeated, scrambles for an answer and then... Eureka! He's got it. He's gonna bet his own daughter. He starts raving about her beauty, completely unhinged and well aware of how tempting his offer is. It's clear the guy's lost it to the gambling fever. He keeps yammering on, oblivious to the absurdity of his words, until a tap on his shoulder brings him back to reality. Are you really gonna take responsibility for that? A voice asks. The question hits him hard and he spins around to face the speaker. It's Eric, kneeling in front of him, all cool and composed. He repeats the question and the Duke, still in his madness, reaffirms his bet, going on and on about his daughter being the most beautiful woman in the Empire, talk about convenient. Eric's all fired up now. This game just got a whole lot more interesting, and even though the stakes are high, he's ready for the next round. The red-headed Joker in their group sees this as just another fun game, but something's off with Bastion. Eric nudges him to play along, and after a moment's hesitation, Bastion agrees. Like a scene straight out of a poker movie, the gens settle in, and our Empire hero shuffles the cards and deals them out. Shall we start? He asks. Well, duh. The room's thick with tension as the game heats up. Everyone's watching closely as these guys duke it out for the title of Gambling King. One dude, totally clueless about what's going on, asks his neighbor for the lowdown and gets filled in about the Duke's crazy bet. Fast forward a bit and the Duke's staring at his cards like they're a death sentence. Eric and Lucas are equally dismayed, but all eyes are on Bastion. He checks his hand, lays his last card down, and... BAM! The room goes wild. It's a perfect win. Amidst the chaos, the Duke sinks further into defeat, barely having time to process his loss before two guys behind him remind him of his bet and tell him to get ready for his new son-in-law. Bastion, taking in the madness, decides he's had enough. He gets up to leave, silencing the uproar as he exits. However, Lucas gives him an earful about how he needs to take his bet seriously. Eric's backing him up, saying it's only fair that they enjoy the spoils of the game. But the Duke? He's not having any of it. He lunges at Bastion, begging for another shot. Bastion holds his gaze, his icy blue eyes meeting the Duke's sea green ones. And then, without missing a beat, he shoves him off like it's nothing. Lucas, being the troublemaker he is, orders the guards to bring in the Duke's daughter. The Duke stuck in his mess, grits his teeth but doesn't back down. He yells at Bastion, warning him about the dangers of messing with his daughter who has the blood of the Imperial family flowing through her veins. Fast forward to midnight. 
Under a starlit sky, we see a stunning young lady crocheting away, lost in thought. She's worried about her dad and when he'll come home. Next to her, a girl named Tira stirs in her sleep. Waking up, she asks Odette about their father. Odette reassures her, even though she herself can't shake off her unease. Odette then tucks Tira into bed, dismissing her fears about the creepy night sounds, insisting it's just the wind. But Tira isn't convinced. She tells Odette she's not a baby anymore, earning a smile and an eye roll from her sister. Back at the dining table, Odette is making a mental checklist of things to do before hitting the sack, including selling the lace she's been working on. Her mind drifts back to a year ago when they had to move due to their dad's money troubles. She remembers Tira's words about the crying noises, but to Odette, those sounds are comforting, a reminder of the roof they have over their heads, thanks to the Imperial family. Her gaze lands on an old photo of her late mother, Princess Helene. She was the Empire's sweetheart, engaged to Crown Prince Rovida and adored by all. But three months before the wedding, she disappeared, running off with Duke Dyson, her secret lover from a minor clan. The news rocked the entire empire. The emperor, heartbroken and disappointed, washes his hands off his daughter. He takes back all her fancy titles and property, and before you know it, she's out of there. Boom! Just like that, her mother goes from royal to rags. But even in the face of it all, her mom never throws in the towel. Now, let's fast forward a bit. Little Odette is blossoming into a fine teenager under the golden sun. One afternoon, her mom drops some serious life advice on her. She tells her to keep her head high, especially when the going gets tough. She's dead set on getting their royal status back, so she insists on Odette getting a top-notch education to prepare for D-Day. Odette learns everything her mom throws her way, dancing, etiquette, music, painting, and of course, language. But then, tragedy strikes one quiet night. Darling, promise me you'll fight to return us to our glory days, her mother whispers with her last breath. And just like that, she's gone, leaving Odette alone with her dreams and a harsh reality. Back in the present, Odette's staring blankly at this old picture when the harsh reality hits her, she's gonna end up just like her mom. Suddenly, a knock on the door jolts her back to reality. Who's there? She shouts, racing towards the door. She swings it wide open to find a uniformed man standing there, not wasting any time with small talk. You Odette? He grills her, and she replies with a quick yes. She asks about her dad, knowing this guy probably knows something. But all he does is tell her to follow him, hinting that her old man might be in some deep financial trouble. The only thought running through her mind is, he's let us down, again. Our poor Odette puts on a brave face, heading back into her room to get ready. Even the guard can't help but feel sorry for her. She's lost in memories of her childhood, remembering her mom's lessons as she gets ready. Finally, she slips on her hat and veil and tells the guard she's good to go. Meanwhile, Odette's father is pleading with the chaperone from earlier. He's begging him to spare his daughter, reminding him of her royal blood. But the chaperone isn't having it. He blames the Duke for putting his own daughter at risk and tells him that a guard was already sent to get Odette. That's when the gravity of what he's done really hits him. Back in the room, Lucas is teasing Bastion about meeting the Emperor's granddaughter. Bastion doesn't buy it though, he's doubting everything the beggar Duke says. He even asks his buddies if they believe it, leading to a mini-argument between Lucas and Eric that earns them an eye roll. Then, the guard announces Odette's arrival. Everyone turns to look, eager to see the Duke's daughter. She walks in with grace, her veil casting mysterious shadows on her face and her wild hair dancing with each step. She goes straight to her dad who's practically a heap on the floor, asking about his debts. There are whispers among the men about her dignified behavior, given she doesn't seem to realize how bad things are. But then Eric spills the beans, telling her about the bet her dad made. Her eyes go wide with shock as Eric points towards the winner, Bastion. Father, she screams, but he's already collapsed at her feet, begging for mercy and making lame excuses. Odette squares her shoulders and turns to Bastion, recognizing his uniform as that of the Navy from the capital. She's torn, should she run away with the man she once knew as her dad? But where would she go? The guards are waiting right outside. She takes a deep breath and approaches Bastion, accusing him of participating in such a shady act. 
He replies with a curt response, making it clear that sometimes, legality isn't always the best solution. Odette is trying her best to make Bastion see sense. She's all righteous fury and pleading eyes, begging him to let her dad off the hook. She even offers to pay off her father's debts, as if she's rolling in dough. But Bastion's having none of it. He's the one calling the shots here, not her. Show me your face, he demands, making it clear he's not interested in her money or trading her for anything. All he wants is for her to lift that veil and end this drama. The room falls silent, save for Lucas and Eric who are clearly enjoying the show. But Bastion? He's thinking things through, wondering what would happen if he lets her go. Her dad would probably just bet her off to another guy. Meanwhile, Beggar Duke is practically begging Odette to do whatever it takes to secure their freedom. Bastion tells her to play by his rules since she's being so stubborn. She reaches up and pulls off her veil. The room goes dead silent as everyone gets their first look at Odette. Her long, wild hair is a striking mix of black and violet, cascading down to her waist. And her eyes, they're like emerald pools you could get lost in. Bastion can't help but remember Beggar Duke bragging about his beautiful daughter. At least he wasn't lying about that, he muses to himself. Fast forward to the next morning. Beggar Duke is passed out, snoring like a freight train. Tira is watching him with pure disgust, asking Odette if she can lock him in. Odette doesn't care what happens to him at this point, she's too exhausted. But Tira's not letting it go. She's all riled up about their dad's drinking and betting habits. She's used to that, but what he did to Odette is a whole new level of low. She can't believe he's sleeping like a baby after what he's done. All Odette cares about is getting home safe, but she can't help replaying last night's events in her mind, especially the part where she had to take off her veil. Tira is still going on about their dad, even threatening to report him to the Imperial family. But Odette shuts her down quickly, reminding her that they might stop helping them if they find out about their dad's shady dealings. She doesn't tell Tira this, though. Instead, she just looks at her and asks for a promise. Tira apologizes and promises to drop the subject. Odette pulls her into a hug, knowing their chances of getting any help from the Imperial family are slim to none. Now, let's take a little detour to Arden, a charming coastal city on the outskirts of the capital. It's got that salty sea breeze and grand mansions that whisper tales of royalty and noble families. The North offers views that'll take your breath away, earning it the nickname Arden Jewel. Once upon a time, this land was home to the prestigious Count clan. But as time moved on, they struggled to keep up and eventually lost their ancestral home. Enter the Clawitz clan, the new kids on the block who are taking the empire's economy by storm. Their wealth and influence are spreading faster than a forest fire in the dry season. They're smart cookies, these guys, with a knack for business and a monopoly on Empireburg's railway system. When the Count clan's prized property went up for grabs, they pounced on it like hungry lions, cementing their place at the top of the food chain. Now, picture this, Bastion's cruising into his family mansion in his shiny car, parking it right in front of the massive mansion doors. Out comes Maria Gross, Bastion's aunt, strutting around like she owns the place. She casts a curious glance at his ride, questioning why he always goes against his dad's wishes, but Bastion just shrugs it off. He extends a hand towards her, but she ignores it, making a snide remark about not being rich enough to afford a chauffeur. Yeah right. They stroll into the mansion together, and let me tell you, this place is something else. It's got maids lined up ready to pamper him, a red carpet that seems to go on forever, chandeliers that sparkle like diamonds, and walls adorned with vintage picture frames and flowers. As they catch up, they chat about his father and the mansion, which Bastion dismisses as nothing more than a fancy prison. Aunt Maria, ever the opportunist, can't help but think about the fortune Bastion inherited from his mother. She tries to probe him about why his grandfather chose him as the heir, leaving Bastion a bit clueless. But Aunt Maria keeps her cool, dropping the bombshell that his brother is engaged to Count Klein's daughter. She's planning to announce it at the party later that night and gushes about how thrilled their father is about the union. But get this, Franz, Bastion's half-brother, is actually the son of a noblewoman. Their dad, who's obsessed with status, didn't hesitate for a second before declaring Franz the heir to the clan. And now that he's marrying a noble, their dad's over the moon. Aunt Maria then turns her attention back to Bastion, urging him to find a wife and start his own family. 
She also warns him to steer clear of Princess Isabel, apparently, she's bad news. But Bastion just laughs it off, telling her he's not interested in the princess. Aunt Maria reminds him that the Emperor might not see things the same way, especially after what happened with his sister, Princess Helene. Bastion's mind immediately flashes back to the casino night when his father mentioned the name Helene and something about imperial blood. But Aunt Maria snaps him out of his thoughts, and he reassures her with a charming smile that she has nothing to worry about. In the next scene, the sun is setting, casting a warm glow on the Empire Berg's imperial palace. Its grandeur and wealth are on full display, but inside, it's a different story. The Empress is having a major meltdown. She's tossing around photos of Bastion, photos she found in her daughter's room, and it's not pretty. The Emperor is trying to calm her down, but she's too busy freaking out over the fact that their daughter is mooning over some other guy while she's set to marry. Isabel is getting married, and that's final, he tells her, but the Empress isn't listening. She brings up Princess Helene and her tragic love story, which instantly earns her an apology from her husband. He's not thrilled about the topic, but he lets her continue. The conversation takes a sharp turn towards Duke Dyson's reckless behavior and his daughter, Odette. It's clear the Empress is worried about her, especially with her father's antics. What if something happens to Odette, she exclaims. The Emperor explains that he's been keeping an eye on the situation because of his sister, Helene. But the Empress cuts him off, saying she can't stand the Duke, but she also can't bear to see Odette suffer. And then she drops the bombshell, she wants Bastion to marry Odette. The Emperor is taken aback, but the Empress insists that Bastion, despite his low status, is a hero and deserves a wife from the Imperial family. Plus, he comes from a wealthy clan. The Emperor is still skeptical, asking why Bastion would choose Odette over other options. That's when the Empress reminds him of the Imperial blood in Odette's veins. She believes this arrangement will protect Isabel and secure her marriage. Somewhere else in the palace, Bastion is descending the grand staircase, blending in with the crowd. His mind is on his father who declined his mother's fortune and the chance to elevate his status by marrying a noblewoman. Suddenly, he spots Sandrine de Lavier, the fiery redhead and Lucas' cousin. She's the Duke's daughter and also the richest woman in Pelia. She saunters over, asking him about his brother's engagement. With a smirk, he tells her it's a good thing for their clan. She mimics his response, admitting she's just being nosy. But here's the thing, Sandrine was once married to Count Renat, but they're getting a divorce due to unresolved issues. There are whispers that she'll return to her role as the Duke's darling daughter next year, as if nothing ever happened. After all, she's part of the powerful Lavier clan. Hey, Bastion! Sandrine calls out, her eyes glinting with mischief. She teases him about his love life, warning him not to rush into anything foolish. Bastion, in his classic sarcastic style, shoots back, reminding her that trends in marriage can change just like that. He advises her not to get her hopes up too high. His words leave her momentarily speechless, but he brushes it off as friendly advice. Their conversation might sound a bit heated to an outsider, but this is their way of bonding. Sandrine quickly changes the subject, hinting that Bastion's mother is giving them the side eye. She praises his strategic mind before disappearing into the crowd, leaving whispers of her remarriage plans in her wake. Word gets around to Aunt Maria, who seems less than thrilled about the news. Meanwhile, Bastion finds himself lost in thought, reminiscing about that fateful night at the casino. He remembers Odette's calm demeanor and porcelain complexion but also her father's destructive habits. His thoughts are interrupted by Aunt Maria, who greets him with a warmth that belies their recent conversation. Bastion tries to play it cool, claiming he needs time to adjust to the party atmosphere. But Aunt Maria isn't buying it, reminding him of the time he nearly met his end after a wolf chase. She recalls how she had been outside taking a break when she heard his cries for help. Back in the mansion, as Bastion was being treated, Aunt Maria gave the teacher a piece of her mind for not keeping a closer eye on Bastion. But the conversation was cut short by the arrival of Zef Klawitz, Bastion's dad, who promptly fired the teacher. His only words to Bastion were a curt reminder of his lucky escape. Aunt Maria knew her brother was off his rocker. She couldn't bear to see Bastion live in such conditions, so she reached out to his mother's family, and soon, Bastion was whisked away by the Eilis clan. Back in the present, Aunt Maria isn't pleased with Sandrine. 
She believes it's disrespectful to label her a divorcee when the process isn't over yet. Although she acknowledges that Bastion needs a bride, she also recognizes that relying on the Lavier clan could be a threat to their own. Nonetheless, Bastion appreciates Aunt Maria's understanding. At least someone gets him, he thinks, as she advises him to keep an open mind. The scene then shifts to our leading lady, Odette, who's sharing a cup of coffee with Madame Countess Trier, the late Emperor's aunt's daughter. Countess Trier playfully scolds Odette for looking so much like her but admits she's glad her father did something right for his children. It's quite obvious she dropped by to check on them when she asks for Duke's whereabouts. Nonetheless, Odette gives her a quick response, telling her how late he will likely return. Not that she's losing any sleep over it, she can't stand the guy. The air is thick with tension as Odette asks why she's there, and Madame spills the beans about a marriage proposal from the Imperial family. Marriage? Are you kidding me? Odette blurts out, unable to hide the disgust in her voice. The elderly lady remains unfazed, clearing her throat before dropping the bombshell, they want her to marry Bastion Clawitz. Odette's eyes widen in shock. She struggles to understand why the Emperor would want this. The conversation shifts to Princess Isabel, who apparently has a crush on Bastion. But that's not all, he's a commoner, which makes him unfit for the princess. Odette absorbs the news silently, maintaining her composure. She wonders if she's just a pawn in their game, but is reassured when she learns that Bastion doesn't share Isabel's feelings. Madame Countess Trier then goes on to talk about the Clawitz clan. Despite their lack of title, they're known for their acumen and have been running a successful business for generations. They're even dubbed the Empire's Kings of Railways. Bastion's father married into a noble family, which elevated his status. But there's a catch, Bastion, the eldest son from his first wife, comes from a lowly bloodline. His mother's family, the Ailes, might be wealthy, but they earned their fortune through shady business dealings. In high society, Bastion is often referred to as the grandson of the junk merchant. The conversation shifts back to the marriage proposal. Madame Trier tries to persuade Odette to accept, revealing that Bastion's father dislikes him and he won't be inheriting anything. She also mentions that Bastion doesn't want to marry into Duke's family. After some contemplation, Odette tells her to relay her thoughts to the Emperor. But the Madame is quick to correct her, it's an order, not a request. Madame Trier encourages Odette to take a chance on Bastion. You never know, she says, Bastion Clawitz could be the man who falls head over heels for you. Fast forward to Bastion's personal townhouse. His butler, Lovis, is at the door, waiting for his arrival. As Bastion steps inside, Lovis notes that the party must have run late. But Bastion is in high spirits, excited about the relationships he needs to maintain. He has no plans of retiring anytime soon. Lovis informs him of a letter from a certain Lady Odette. Bastion draws a blank, so Lovis fills him in, she's from the Emperor. With that, Lovis retires for the night, leaving Bastion alone with the letter. As he stares at it, the reality of the situation sinks in, he's getting married. Apparently, a few days earlier, Bastion got a surprise visit from Marquis Demel, the naval hotshot. Demel dropped the bombshell. The Emperor wants Bastion hitched to Lady Odette, daughter of the legendary Helene. As he sunk into his cushy couch, Bastion couldn't help but feel a wave of disappointment wash over him. Seriously, Emperor? He's got to think about the Emperor's honor, but man, this was tough. He finally plucked up the courage to read the letter. And there it was, her name written in the corner of the letter, throwing him into another deep thought session. Fast forward a bit, and we've got Odette clutching a piece of paper like it's a lifeline. She's jittery but decides to bite the bullet and read the letter. She's always thought Bastion was a bit of a jerk, especially after that three-line note he sent in response to her heartfelt letter. Now she's left wondering what kind of guy Bastion really is. Backing out crosses her mind, but then she remembers the old lady's words, which felt more like a threat than advice. She glances at the dresses hanging on her wall, her mother's dress among them. She never thought she'd be wearing it under such crummy circumstances. But hey, when the Emperor orders, you obey, right? Still, she makes a mental note to meet this mysterious Imperial dude. After all, if they're gonna tie the knot, she might as well know who she's dealing with. 
Wednesday comes and we see our red-headed hero Lucas, pulling on his boots and grumbling about Navy school being a pain in the backside. He's feeling that familiar knot in his stomach as he voices out his worries. Enter Bastion, chiming in while wrestling with his tie, questioning why he signed up for this gig in the first place. Lucas tells Bastion that his old man might disown him, or worse, if he doesn't tow the family line. He delves deeper into the conversation, asking Bastion if it's all worth it, and drops the news about his father's wish to share a drink with him whenever they both have some free time. Bastion is touched by the invitation, but that doesn't stop Lucas from throwing in some playful jabs. As Lucas heads for the door, Bastion throws a question his way, asking what his secret is. Lucas stops dead in his tracks, giving us a glimpse of his side profile as he mulls over an answer. The hound dog guarding his territory. That's how Count of Alt sees me, he thinks to himself, flashing back to a memory when he was bullied by his peers who didn't believe he was Count of Alt's son. They taunted him for being the weak link in a family of navy officers, but Bastion swooped in just in time, giving the bullies a piece of his mind. Lucas was grateful for his knight in shining armor, and Bastion was equally glad to make friends with Count of Alt's sensitive son. Ever since then, Lucas has been riding a wave of good fortune, thanks to his connection with the Avalt clan. Shaking off the memories, Lucas figures being a hound dog isn't so bad, especially when the rewards are worthwhile. He doesn't get a response from Bastion, so he switches gears, asking about the upcoming meeting with the lady. Bastion gives himself a once-over in the mirror, clearly liking what he sees. When Lucas mentions Sandrine and the potential chaos she could cause, Bastion mutters something about being unable to control the situation. Lucas warns him to tread carefully around a woman like her. Bastion knows that Princess Isabel will soon marry Crown Prince Belov and leave Berg. Until then, he's willing to play along with the marriage plans, confident that the Emperor won't pressure him once he's shown his goodwill. After that, he should be free to marry Sandrine, she's already divorced, after all. His mind is spinning. He can't let this mess derail his plans. It'd be great if Lady Odette turns out to be easygoing, he muses. Later that day, we're treated to the sight of Odette in all her splendor, thanks to her mother's dress. She's seated at a reserved table, waiting for Bastion. Her beauty is breathtaking, her wild hair cascading down to her waist. But confusion mars her features, has she been stood up? Just as she's about to lose patience, a well-dressed man in uniform walks in. The chaperone points him towards his reservation. Odette is taken aback. This is her future husband, but it's not their first meeting. Her mind flashes back to the winner of the bet from the casino on that fateful night. Bastion, so taken aback by her presence in their reserved booth that he double-checks his reservation. The penny finally drops, the duke from the casino wasn't joking about his daughter's royal blood, it has to be her. Being the smooth operator he is, he introduces himself, reminding Odette of their previous encounter. But our girl isn't easily impressed, she watches his every move as he fixes himself a cup of joe. When she finally breaks the silence, her words are laced with thinly veiled accusations. But Bastion doesn't get defensive. He admits he had no clue about the Emperor's plans, nor did he know her father was a duke willing to sell off his daughter, the Emperor's niece, for cash. His words hit Odette hard, disappointment creasing her forehead. She realizes that Bastion wants nothing to do with her or this arranged marriage, a sentiment she shares, thank goodness. She's not great at hiding her feelings, though, and pretty much begs Bastion to reject her. Her voice is sharper than before, but Bastion meets her gaze and reassures her he won't reject her. He even compliments her dignity, something he noticed from their first meeting. But when he brings up the rumors about her family, she acknowledges them with a roll of her eyes and an increasing impatience. Then, plot twist. Bastion reveals his true intentions, to stay loyal to the Emperor. When Odette misunderstands this as him wanting to marry her, he quickly sets her straight, explaining how difficult it would be to marry her. He suggests they play along until Princess Isabel gets married. But when Odette misinterprets this as tricking the Emperor, he clarifies that they need to make their pretend relationship look believable. He also reminds her of his title and the importance of obeying the Emperor's orders. Odette brings up the potential damage to his reputation from her family's scandalous history, but Bastion couldn't care less. He's no gentleman, after all. With a cheeky smirk, he advises her not to worry about what others think. 
He mentions something about the Emperor valuing his daughter's opinion more than a Navy officer's and hints at Odette having a reason for agreeing to meet him. But he doesn't linger on the topic. Instead, he's up and heading for the exit. Odette calls after him, offering to pay for the tea so she won't owe him anything. But Bastion just laughs it off, advising her to save her money, especially given her father's gambling habits. When she asks what he means, his response leaves her stunned, she might not be so lucky next time. As she watches him leave, she can't shake the feeling that he looks down on her. But he's still willing to follow the Emperor's order, just pretending to be engaged until the princess gets married. His plans will definitely make things work. She watches him as he exits the building. In the next scene, Odette is trudging home, her heart heavy with disappointment. That meet up with Bastion? A total disaster. She's swearing off seeing him again but knows she's stuck in this crazy situation. As she nears her house, shouts ring out like a bad rock concert. She breaks into a sprint, her mind filled with worry about her little sis, Tira. She edges towards the slightly open door, spotting Tira in a heated face-off with their dad. He's trying to snatch away their hard-earned savings, but Tira isn't backing down. Suddenly, he raises his hand, and Odette takes the hit. She jumped in front of Tira like some kind of action hero. Their dad is stunned. Odette doesn't miss a beat. She gets up, warning her dad to never lay a finger on Tira again. When he doesn't back down, she drops the bombshell, if he doesn't stop, she'll cut off his subsidy from the Imperial family. Her words hang in the air, her gaze steady and fierce. He finally backs off, stomping off while hurling curses at them. Odette watches him go, wondering how much more drama this day can dish out. But she knows she's her dad's Achilles heel, as long as he gets that subsidy, he won't let go of his daughters. Even though they have different moms, Odette loves Tira and will do anything to protect her. Don't be weak, she tells herself, ready to face whatever comes next. As night falls, Lovis strides over to Bastion with an invitation to the Empress's birthday party. Bastion admires the fancy invite, looking forward to the glam and glitter of the royal ball. But there's something else on his mind too, Odette. Fast forward to the big day. Nobles in their fancy carriages head to the Imperial Palace. Among them is the Clawwitz family. Count Clawwitz can't contain his excitement about being recognized as a noble family. But his son Franz seems clueless about his dad's enthusiasm. The Count fills him in, but Franz isn't buying it. This leads to some tension in the carriage, with the Countess trying to lighten the mood by bringing up Lady Dyson's attendance at the ball. But her husband's harsh response only stirs the pot. He dismisses Dyson as a beggar, not a duke or noble. Then, the conversation shifts to Bastion's marriage plans, and the Count just can't get why his son would want to tie himself to such a scandal-ridden family. Clearly, this night is just getting started, and there's plenty of drama still to come. The Countess is sitting there, her gaze fixed on her husband but her mind is off in La La Land. She's thinking about how her family, this Count Oswald's crew, managed to get the Clawitz clan into the upper echelons of society. But that fancy status? It only covers her, hubby dearest, and Franz. Elite society doesn't roll out the red carpet for folks from humble beginnings, even if it's Bastion. Yet somehow, that kid managed to claw his way up here. She remembers Jeff and how she had to send his ex-wife packing to make room for herself. Just thinking about it makes her smile like the cat that got the cream. What a hoot! Keeping up her angelic smile, she responds to Franz's question about Odette bringing honor to their clan. Her words are as sharp as a chef's knife as she crosses Odette off the honorable list. Franz tries to keep the conversation going, but his folks shut him down, telling him to focus on himself and his bro's appearance at the ball. After all, they need to show off what the Clawwitz heir is made of. Next scene. The Imperial Palace is decked out in all its red and gold glory, filled to the brim with nobles and royalties. The Herald announces the big shots as they arrive, and to everyone's surprise, he calls out Captain Bastion Clawitz. Franz watches his half-brother from the sidelines, his thoughts as dark as a stormy night. He labels Bastion a cowardly critter, poor guy. Franz is simmering in his own pool of hatred when a fellow nobleman strides past him to greet Bastion. The nobles swarm around Bastion, making him both pleased and peeved. Franz, on the other hand, is green with envy. 
His fiance, Ella von Klein, comments on the interaction between Duke Gerhard and Bastion. Suddenly, Bastion spots Franz in the crowd and heads over to chat with him and his fiance. The brothers exchange pleasantries, and then the Herald announces the arrival of the Lady of Duke Dyson's family. Franz's smile widens, thinking Odette will be the downfall of his brother's first imperial ball. But boy, is he wrong. Odette steps into the spotlight, looking every bit the royal lady she is. She glides across the room, her hair neatly styled and her gown sparkling like a starry night. Franz can't help but gape at her beauty, his mind spinning. The party is in full swing, with music filling the air and people dancing their hearts out. The Emperor and Empress are also enjoying the festivities from their thrones. All eyes are on Captain Bastion and Lady Odette, including Franz who just can't seem to take his eyes off them. What a night to remember! The royal dance wraps up and Bastion pulls Odette into a chat. He's thinking she's in way over her head, but then she spills the beans. The Imperial Order? It's a big deal for her. She's ready to play her part, or so he thinks. But wait a second, there's something that's not quite adding up for him. Odette's reputation is on the line here, and she knows it. That only means one thing, she's got a request for the Emperor. Both of them have their own agendas, and Bastion figures they can use that to their advantage. As he twirls her around in the dance, causing her to fall into his arms, he whispers about how she can win over the Majesty with her actions. Rewinding a bit, we see Odette and Countess Trier having a heart-to-heart -heart as they stroll down the hallway after the party. The madam reminds Odette that the future of the Dysons family is riding on her shoulders. She needs to be on her best behavior and keep her promise to convince the Majesty to keep the subsidy for her family, even if the marriage goes south. The older woman assures her that she's got her back. Odette thanks her and heads back to the ballroom. The madam watches her go, feeling sorry for her. She knows Odette must be overwhelmed by this whole new world. She may have brought her to the ball, but it still doesn't feel right to see her being used like this. But Odette? She's busy admiring the palace, her mind wandering back to stories her mom used to tell about the Imperial Palace. Her mom would get so excited whenever she talked about the Grand Garden in full bloom. Suddenly, Odette breaks down in tears. She's filled with regret. Why did she choose this path? She thinks about her mom who betrayed her country and family for a fleeting love. Once that love was gone, there was nothing left. But Odette vows to never live like that. She refuses to trade her dignity for wealth. Money is important, yes, but it shouldn't come at the cost of her life. I'm betting my subsidy on this marriage. But I know I will be looked down on. I only need a reason to put up a play with this man, she says as she heads back to the ballroom. Back to Bastion, he gives her a quick pep talk, reminding her to keep up the act because everyone's watching, especially Isabel. He takes a moment to admire her outfit and jewelry, throwing in a compliment or two. But then he ruins the moment by asking if she's planning to return the jewelry after the party. She gives him a blank look, remembering some of the things she knows about him. She finally responds, holding her head high. She tells him that she rented the jewelry and that she's got enough money for other things. But Bastion doesn't stop there. He teases her about being richer than he thought and she fires back, thanking him for his concern. They go back and forth like ping pong until finally, a mutual understanding emerges. Bastion voices his concerns about Odette's spending habits, which she surprisingly agrees with. Feeling confident, he invites her to a fancy dinner. But Odette's not having any of it. She makes up an excuse that's as clear as day, she doesn't want to get tangled in debts she can't pay off. Yet, they continue to dance, looking like two lovebirds on the dance floor. In jest, Bastion suggests selling her off to cover the debts, but Odette's not buying it. She reminds him of their first meeting and how he didn't exactly make the best impression. Odette is one tough cookie, always holding her head high and refusing to accept defeat. Bastion can't help but admire her, his gaze lingering on her long, graceful neck. But his thoughts are interrupted by a sudden twist in the story. Princess Isabel makes her grand entrance, striding down the stairs towards them, completely unfazed by the whispers around her. As she gets closer, she lands a slap on Odette's cheek, commanding her to steer clear of Bastion. To add insult to injury, she labels her a beggar. 
Behind the scenes, it turns out that the princess had been watching Bastion and Odette from the gallery, seething with anger. She blames her mother for letting her attend the ball and witness Bastion with his new flame. Yet, she insists she's over him and can't be hurt. She reflects on how she's watched him for the past six years, realizing that he's only dancing with Odette due to an imperial order, not because he likes her. A war hero with humble origins and the daughter of an abandoned princess, what a juicy combo that's sure to grab the attention of the elites. This might even be enough to overshadow the odd rumors about her. But how does Bastion feel about being stuck in this predicament? She feels sorry for him, thinking she's the only one who truly understands his feelings. She's convinced he loves her but can't express it because of his loyalty to the military. She wonders if he's suppressing his feelings for her because of their status difference. She thinks Odette is just playing a role for money and doesn't understand Bastion's situation. The tension skyrockets, and we're all wondering how Odette will handle this curveball. Princess Isabel, now in full attack mode, accuses Odette of doing all this to escape her slum life, even at the cost of her self-respect. Odette is stunned into silence, staring at the floor in shock and embarrassment. Bastion tries to defuse the situation, but Isabel spills the beans about Odette trying to seduce him for his wealth, labeling her a courtesan. Despite the harsh words, Odette knows she can protect her heart. She's certain she won't get hurt because she's not sincerely involved. She's just playing a part for the Imperial Order. As she picks up the broken necklace from the floor, she reflects on everything that's unfolded, ready to face whatever comes next. Isabel isn't done though. She accuses Odette of being a gold digger, only interested in shiny trinkets. But when Odette stays mum, Isabel gets even more riled up. Odette hands her broken necklace off to a chaperone for safekeeping and turns back to the drama. Isabel, fuming at being ignored, moves to confront Odette. But before she can, Bastion swoops in and saves the day. He calls Isabel's name and locks eyes with her. She's so taken aback by his handsome features that she forgets her anger and melts into his arms. In her tipsy state, she convinces herself that he loves her and that's why he's come to her rescue. But poor Bastion is just trying to keep the peace. He can't help but cringe at the strong smell of alcohol on her breath. He tells her she's had too much to drink and tries to calm her down with a comforting hug. Meanwhile, the Empress watches the whole scene unfold from the gallery above. She's so embarrassed by Isabel's behavior that she falls to her knees in tears. The palace is buzzing with whispers and hushed conversations. The Clawwitz family can't help but worry that this spectacle will tarnish their reputation. And through all this chaos, Isabel continues her drunken display. Bastion has had enough and pushes her away, disappointment written all over his face. Isabel's brother steps in and drags her away, but she's too lost in her fantasies to snap back to reality. With Isabel gone, Bastion turns his attention back to Odette. He notices her tucking a loose strand of hair behind her ear and wonders what could have rattled her. He thinks back to the night he won her in a bet and how she never lost her cool. He admires her resilience and decides she deserves a proper greeting. As they approach Madame Countess Trier, Bastion notices Odette looking a bit pale. He whispers to her to keep her composure so they don't attract any more attention. The Countess, on the other hand, can't help but be intrigued by Bastion's aristocratic demeanor. She wonders why he's never been invited to the palace before. When they finally reach the Countess, she asks Bastion about his time with Odette. He tells her he enjoyed their time together and bids them good night. The Countess and Odette chat for a while, but Odette is starting to feel the strain of the evening. Still, the Countess congratulates her on handling the night so well and shares some fond memories of Odette's late mother. With that, they call it a night, leaving Odette to reflect on the eventful evening. Shifting to a new scene, we see Beggar Duke getting kicked out of a gambling house again. This time, it's because he couldn't quit his bad habit and kept making a scene, trying to convince the guy in charge that he was going to win big and share the non-existent winnings. The croupier wasn't having any of it and basically told him to take a hike. Duke, though, blamed his bad luck on his frenemy Bastion and the crew, not his own dicey choices. Just when Duke was feeling all kinds of sorry for himself, an old buddy shows up. This friend knows all about Duke's gambling woes but decides to switch the topic to something even juicier, Duke's daughter, Odette. He hints that Odette might be in a bit of a situation because of some guy she's seeing, which could mean more money troubles. Duke laughs it off, 
thinking his friends got it all wrong. But then, the plot thickens. The friend spills the beans about Odette sneaking around at night and being seen in a fancy carriage, hinting she might have snagged herself a rich guy. He tries to get Duke to worry more about what his daughter's up to than his next bet. Duke starts to wonder if there's some truth to the gossip. And as if on cue, he spots Odette out and about, looking all elegant and in a hurry. He can't help but think about what his friend said and decides to keep an eye on her. Odette ends up at this upscale restaurant, meeting with Madame Countess Trier. It turns out, they're there to talk about a necklace and its welfare. Madame seems interested when Odette talks about making things right and even mentions bringing the issue to the Emperor. But Madame Trier isn't easily impressed and doubts the Emperor would care. Still, Odette doesn't back down, suggesting that Madame Trier's status might actually make a difference. In the end, Madame Trier agrees to consider Odette's request to fix the necklace, especially since all the stones are accounted for, making the repair easier. Madame is taken aback by Odette's mix of steeliness and genuine excitement over small wins, seeing a side of her that's not often shown. The conversation then takes an unexpected turn when the topic shifts to Princess Isabel. Turns out, she's been sent off to cool her heels in a summer place until she can get her act together. The advice on the table for Odette? Focus on her marriage with the Duke, which, by the looks of it, might actually be on the upswing considering his recent actions. And just when you think things can't get more movie-like, who walks in but the Admiral and Bastion? Talk about timing! The Admiral can't hide his surprise, oh my god, he exclaims, running into Madame Trier like this. She plays along, acting all surprised and thrilled by this coincidence. Poor Odette standing there trying to piece together how she knows the Admiral, while Madame Trier is already rolling out the red carpet for Captain Clawitz, aka Bastion. But Bastion? He's not exactly returning the warm vibes, especially with Odette catching his eye and holding it like she's got some kind of spell on him. As they sit down to lunch, Bastion's got his detective hat on. Something about this whole setup smells fishy to him. It's Saturday, the place is buzzing, and they're smack dab in the middle of the restaurant where you can't miss them. He's nursing his drink, piecing it all together, it's got to be a setup to blast his and Odette's relationship into the spotlight. He's trying not to overthink it, but can't help wondering what the Emperor, or anyone else for that matter, would make of their relationship after the chaos at the ball. But hey, as long as he gets to see Odette, right? Meanwhile, the Admiral decides to chat about the weather, noting how it feels more like winter than April. He then shifts gears to talk shop about the upcoming polo match between the Army and Navy, hyping it up as the event of the season. Madame Trier's all ears, asking if Bastion will be there, and of course, he confirms. The Admiral doesn't miss a beat, boasting about Bastion being the star player. Madame Trier nods along, giving props to Bastion's skills beyond the battlefield. And just like that, Bastion's pegged as the hero of the hour, with hints of a promotion in the air. Odette, meanwhile, is trying to focus on her meal amidst the chatter, feeling a bit guilty about the untouched food. As the talk of the polo match goes on, the Admiral invites Odette to come as Bastion's plus one, hinting at the tradition of players' partners showing up. Odette's mind races to the ball, knowing she'll have to play her part perfectly, especially with all the nobles watching. It's a daunting thought, but she's in. She's already strategizing on how to navigate the evening without getting caught up in any drama. Madame Trier, in her ever so mysterious manner, leans in to whisper something about a secret deal with the Admiral. She tells Odette to stick close to Bastion as they part ways, leaving behind a cryptic farewell that has Odette and Bastion exchanging puzzled looks. Walking down the street, there's a comfortable silence between them, the kind that doesn't rush to fill the void with noise. Bastion's the one to break it, opening up about how he feels thrown into the spotlight with Odette, despite the lack of a cheering audience. He's been told to make their relationship more public, a decree straight from the Emperor himself, and while it might not be their first choice, it's what's on the table. Odette listens, but words seem to escape her. When Bastion asks if there's anywhere she'd like to go, she draws a blank. It's not every day you find yourself scripting a public romance, after all. She admits she's new to this whole couple thing, unsure of where couples usually hang out or what they do. Bastion, initially on board with following orders, decides maybe their original plan isn't the way to go. But then, Odette has a lightbulb moment, a plan that involves a bit of rumor milling and playing to the crowd. 
Bastion's on board, seeing the potential in a strategy that plays the game without sticking to the conventional playbook. As they brainstorm the perfect spot for their couple debut, they rule out the usual suspects. The Opera House? Too mainstream and ticket trouble. Shopping malls? Too crowded and common. Hotels? Definitely not the vibe for someone of Odette's caliber. Eventually, Bastion thinks of an art museum, a place that begs for quiet contemplation and, apparently, now, a bit of performance art. From a discreet distance, the Duke watches this unfold, nodding to himself as he finally sees what his friend had been talking about. But it's not just any man with his daughter, it's that officer from the casino night, the one with the lucky streak. Inside the museum, Odette and Bastion become the exhibit everyone's talking about. The nobles can't help but watch, their interest piqued by this unexpected pairing. Bastion, for his part, is soaking in the ambience, stealing looks at Odette who, suddenly inspired by a bout of spontaneity, makes a dash for the exit. The snow outside greets them like a scene from a storybook, and Bastion can't help but feel like this whole setup might just be a blessing in disguise. He had dreaded the Emperor's command at first, but now, standing here with Odette, it feels like he's been handed an unexpected gift. Even the looming figure of the princess seems less intimidating now. Despite her modest means, Odette carries her noble lineage with grace, making Bastion ponder the implications of a union with her, not just for love, but for the status it would confer. As he places his cap on her head and whispers about playing their roles to the hilt, he's already planning ahead, committed to giving this arrangement his all until the end. Yet, there's a twinge of regret for using her in this grand scheme. Their presence in the museum hasn't gone unnoticed, whispers fill the air, painting them as the couple of the moment, far removed from the scandalous rumors that once surrounded Bastion. The crowd's buzzing, not so subtly hinting that these two are stealing the spotlight from the actual art. They're not exactly whispering, either. The chatter is loud enough that Bastion and Odette catch bits and pieces about their families, with the onlookers seemingly rooting for this to be the talk of the town, ball incident be damned. Mid-conversation, Bastion notices Odette's gotten a bit quiet. When he checks in, she waves it off, saying she's just really into the painting they're standing in front of. Bastion, ever the gentleman, suggests they linger a bit longer, maybe even check out the special exhibit. Odette, however, has other plans. She needs to head out to pick up her younger sister from school. Bastion's taken aback by the mention of a sister, having always thought Odette was an only child. She fills him in on Tira's backstory, same dad, different moms. Tira's mom used to work around the house but isn't in the picture anymore, leaving Tira to face some pretty harsh labels. But to Odette, Tira's nothing short of family. Odette's mind starts racing, thinking about how rough Tira's had it, especially with their dad. The thought alone is enough to stir a protective rage in her. She's determined to look out for Tira, especially since their father's attitude does a complete 180 whenever money's mentioned. Snapping back to the present, Bastion's curious about Odette's relationship with Tira, which Odette confirms is incredibly close. Bastion seems genuinely happy for her, suggesting it's time they made their exit. Odette can't help but reflect on how family dynamics can be so different, recalling Madame Trier's comments about the Clawitz brothers at the ball. It makes her wonder what Bastion might be holding back beneath his composed exterior. As they step outside, the snow's picking up. Bastion offers to drop Odette off at the train station, where she plans to meet Tira. She insists on going alone, not wanting to stress Tira out more than necessary. Bastion, trying to respect her wishes, decides to head out for dinner instead of pushing the issue. Still, he can't help but watch them from afar, noting how different the sisters look from each other. Just as a train pulls in, the crowd surges forward, nearly sweeping the sisters away. From his car, Bastion doubts they'll make it on board. But as he's about to drive off, he changes his mind and heads back to the station, only to find they've already boarded, leaving him to marvel at their resilience. In the next scene, the vibe is buzzing at the Polo Arena. It's decked out to the nines, and you can tell everyone's pumped for what's about to go down. Enter Odette, turning heads left and right as she steps onto the scene. Despite feeling a bit out of her element, she channels all those high society tips her mom used to drill into her, which, funny enough, she always thought were pretty pointless. But hey, look at her now, mixing it up with the creme de la creme. Suddenly, this redhead bombshell, Lady Sandrine de Lavier, makes a beeline for Odette. 
She's all grace and smiles, dropping a hello like their old pals. Odette, doing her best impression of elegance, returns the greeting and they chat about almost meeting properly at that infamous ball. Then, in a move straight out of a drama series, Sandrine leans in close, whispers some cryptic advice about remembering her name because their paths are gonna cross a bunch, and then she's off. Talk about an entrance, right? Odette's still trying to process that little encounter when another voice pops up, throwing around Lady Sandrine's pre-countess name like it's no big deal. This lady in a stunning yellow gown jumps right into gossip mode, reminiscing about a past party and quickly catching on that Odette is Klein's kid and engaged to Sir Franz Closets, which seems to tickle her pink. But Odette's mind is still stuck on the whole Sandrine situation, especially the bit about not using her soon-to-be ex-husband's name. The yellow gowned lady spills the tea that Sandrine's headed for Divorceville, which honestly, in their little town, is the kind of news that spreads faster than wildfire. As the party picks up, Odette finds herself in the thick of all the high society chatter, with folks marveling at how effortlessly she fits in. Her accent, her demeanor, it's all apparently top-tier lady material. Then, along comes Claudine Von Brandt, throwing compliments Odette's way about her dress, asking if it's from Rain. Odette's internally panicking, having zero clues about Rain and wondering if she's missing out on some exclusive fashion memo. The gossip mill doesn't stop there. A whisper here, a whisper there, about how the Emperor should have hooked Odette up with a wardrobe fit for her new status. Someone else chimes in, hinting maybe the wedding prep rush left her with no time for a shopping spree. Amidst this fashion face-off, Odette plays it cool, admitting fashion's not really her thing and leaving the heavy lifting to her chaperone. But she adds a little zinger about how lucky she is to share a similar look with the Countess's daughter, which means she gets to try on all sorts of fancy dresses from various tailors. Lady Brandt, amidst the fashion face-off, actually drops a helpful hint to Odette about checking out this store she mentioned earlier. You know, just trying to smooth things over after realizing her oops moment with the dress mix-up. Meanwhile, the rest of the ladies are just dying to see who comes out on top in this little style skirmish, but then the guys start rolling in, each pairing up with their dates. Lady Brandt, feeling a bit like she's lost this round, tries to duck out but not before setting the record straight about the dress being from Sabine's shop. Odette gives her a nod, appreciating the gesture. As everyone starts to drift off to join their plus ones, Odette spots Franz and makes a beeline for him, all while he's getting an earful from his fiancée for being late. But before Odette can get to Franz, Bastion swoops in, grabs her hand, and they're off in another direction. She tries to tell him she was just going to say hi to his brother, but Bastion's not having any of it, calling Franz that thing and leaving Odette pretty much gobsmacked by the sibling rivalry. Out of the corner of her eye, Odette notices Lady Sandrine skulking around, clearly keeping tabs on Bastion and Odette. It's obvious she's not thrilled about how things are playing out, especially considering her own mess of a love life and pending divorce. The vibe at the party keeps cranking up, and Bastion and Odette are doing their best impression of a power couple, with him playfully teasing her about saving money by wearing that dress. They're turning heads, including a couple of ladies gossiping about Bastion's sudden shift from priest-like behavior to potential husband material. Just when things are getting good, Bastion catches a signal from Lady Sandrine for a private chat. He makes up some excuse to ditch Odette for a sack, who decides it's a good time to hit the ladies' room. Meanwhile, Sandrine's stewing in her own drama, regretting her marriage now that she's discovered her husband's preferences don't exactly align with hers. She's determined to make Bastion hers, confrontation and all. When Bastion and Sandrine finally have their talk, it's clear she's upset he didn't fill her in on the whole Odette situation. Bastion's like, it's not really my call, but tries to keep the peace by explaining their arrangement. Sandrine's not satisfied, though, pushing for some kind of commitment. Bastion, ever the gentleman, gently shuts her down, saying he respects her too much to start something based purely on attraction. Despite the letdown, he advises her to hold on to her dignity. Sandrine's left reflecting on their encounter, thinking maybe there's still a chance for her, especially once her divorce is finalized. She's convinced that if she plays her cards right, she'll be the one Bastion can't resist, setting her sights on becoming the one thing he can't ignore. So, there they are, all lined up in the field, guys on one side, ladies on the other, gearing up for the big pre-game tradition. Odette's kind of scratching her head at the whole thing when Bastion leans in with a cheeky grin, asking her for something small, a token for good luck, saying it's gotta represent her heart or something equally sentimental. Seeing through her baffled look, he gently unties the ribbon from her hair, making a show of it because, hey, all eyes are on them. 
He reassures her, promising to take extra care of this ribbon. Cut to the game, and there's Bastion, charging around with Odette's ribbon now tied to his stick. She can't help but roll her eyes, typical Bastion, always going for the dramatic flair. And as she's watching him, her mind wanders back to that tense chat he had with Lady Sandrine, and she's mentally kicking herself for even thinking about his complicated love life right now. The crowd's going wild, cheering on the players, and Bastion's soaking it all in, totally pumped. The game's heating up, and it looks like Bastion's got a tough shot ahead of him. But then, with a swift move and a burst of speed, he nails it, sending the ball flying straight into the goal. The ref waves the blue flag, it's a win. The place erupts into cheers, and Bastion's the hero of the hour. Odette can't help but join in, clapping like crazy, totally caught up in the moment. Meanwhile, back in the player's lounge, Sandrine is on a mission, dragging her cousin Lucas along as she tries to track down Bastion. Lucas fills her in, Bastion's freshening up after getting drenched in champagne. As they chat about the game, Sandrine spots Bastion's stick, with Odette's ribbon still attached. She's taken aback, realizing Bastion actually got involved in the pregame tradition for once, something he usually avoids like the plague. Jealousy flares up as she snatches the ribbon, planning to trash it but then pausing to admire its beauty, even in the mud. Flashback to earlier, and Sandrine's fretting over Odette showing up to the victory dinner. Lucas tries to calm her down, hinting that Odette's just part of some temporary scheme. He almost spills too much about how Bastion and Odette met but catches himself, knowing it could spell trouble if Sandrine digs deeper. Sandrine, though, isn't satisfied, convinced their little fling has an expiration date. She's mulling over her own situation, stuck with her dad when she could be marrying Rich with her looks. But then, she wonders if maybe she's aiming higher, holding out for Bastion with the Emperor's blessing no less. Knowing Odette's not exactly a threat in the grand scheme of things, Sandrine decides it's time to make her move. Fast forward, and there's Odette, trying to psych herself up for the party, knowing she's got to play the part of Bastion's date. Just as she's bracing herself, someone calls out, wishing her luck. It's a nice touch, but she's got bigger fish to fry, especially when she stumbles upon her ribbon, discarded in the mud. Her heart sinks as she picks up the muddy ribbon. It hits her hard, she feels just like that ribbon, tossed aside after the game, no longer needed by Bastion. That's when someone comes up to check on her, but instead of diving into how she's feeling, Odette uses the opportunity to send a message back to Bastion through this lady. She tells her she's feeling sick and that's why she's ducking out early from the party. As she walks away, she's kicking herself for not setting clearer boundaries in there, whatever it was they had going on. While she's heading home, Odette's mind is racing, doing the math on what she earns from the Imperial Allowance. She knows deep down that relying on that money isn't a long-term plan. Wandering down the street, she's lost in thoughts about Tira and their plan to get away from their dad once Tira finishes school. Determined, Odette decides she's ready to work twice as hard, even if it means less sleep. Just then, like fate's giving her a nudge, she spots a job-opening flyer that seems too good to be true. Right at that moment, a fancy carriage rolls by, and who else but Franz spots her. He's puzzled, wondering why she's not with Bastion. Not wasting a second, he stops the carriage, feeling like luck's on his side. Franz approaches her, full of hope, ready to confront these feelings he's had since they first met. Back at the party, Lucas is rambling about how he regrets not convincing Sandrine to stay longer, especially now that Odette's left. Bastion can tell something's off, it's not like Odette to leave without a word. He's known her to be so proper, almost to a fault. Then Eric points out Odette's ribbon in the mud, sparking a mix of reactions from the guys. But Bastion, focused on the ribbon, picks it up, feeling responsible for it, regardless of how it ended up there or whether he likes it or not. It was given to him, and he intends to take care of it. Meanwhile, Franz, having stepped down from his carriage, misses Odette by seconds. He's left there, trying to catch a glimpse of her, wondering if she's okay. The party's still buzzing, but Franz can't shake off his curiosity. He ends up asking his fiancée about Odette's sudden departure and gets an earful about Bastion and the ribbon incident. His fiancée's tone is sharp, hinting at a grim future for Odette once Bastion's done with her. The smile she gives Franz doesn't sit right with him. Lost in thought, Franz reflects on his parents' views on marriage, especially the ones arranged for status or titles. 
Oddly enough, he finds himself wishing Odette was with Bastion instead, worried about how she'll be treated by everyone, including his brother. Yet, part of him can't help but dream of having Odette for himself. The next day, Robies, the housekeeper, is doing his usual rounds through the house when he notices Bastion, buried in work even on his day off. With a raised eyebrow, Robies offers to whip up a fresh pot of tea since the first one's gone cold. Curiosity gets the better of him, and he can't resist sneaking a peek at Bastion's desk. His eyes widen at the sight of a women's clothing catalog. Planning to jump into fashion retail, he muses to himself as he heads to the kitchen. Meanwhile, Bastion's deep in thought about Odette. He can't shake off how she always borrows clothes to blend into high society, where everyone sees her as nothing more than the beggar duke's daughter. It bugs him that the emperor doesn't do more for her, especially since she's out there protecting his daughter. Shouldn't he make sure she doesn't get stuck with the beggar duke's daughter label? Bastion ponders. Suddenly, Robies' voice cuts through his thoughts. Master, he yells, dashing over to inform Bastion about the commotion at the front door. And guess who's causing the stir? The beggar duke himself. Talk about timing. Deciding to face the music, Bastion invites him in for a chat over dinner, both of them throwing not-so-friendly looks over cups of calming mint tea. The beggar duke wastes no time airing his grievances, declaring he doesn't deserve the hero title. Bastion tries to play it cool, but the duke isn't having any of it, accusing Bastion of trying to pull a fast one. Bastion, reaching his limit, urges the duke to cut to the chase. Without warning, the duke slams his fist on the table, shouting about Bastion not being worthy of his daughter because he lacks wealth. Bastion, under his breath, mutters bastard, which sends the duke into a rage. But Bastion stands his ground, reminding the duke of his past mistakes, including selling his daughter over debts. The duke tries to defend his actions, but Bastion's not buying it, hinting at the rumors of his feelings for Odette. The duke insists that only he can give permission for anything concerning his daughter, suggesting a noble family would be a better match than a new noble like Bastion. But Bastion quickly catches on to the duke's real agenda, money. He lays it out straight, no money is coming from him. He also hints that the emperor has plans for Odette that don't involve letting her go anytime soon. As the conversation heats up, Bastion's final remark about returning Odette safe and sound sends the duke storming out, leaving behind a scene of chaos at the dinner table. Bastion, hardly phased, suggests the duke seek cultured conversation at the palace next time, shaking his head as the evening's events take an uncultured turn. After the duke storms out, Bastion is pretty unfazed. He's seen enough drama for a lifetime and is more worried about how Odette has to deal with her dad being a handful. Without skipping a beat, he asks Robies to get in touch with the Sabine store. He wants to arrange an appointment for some new dresses for Odette, but first things first, he has to make sure the Duke is properly shown out. Cut to Odette, looking all serene by the window, the sunlight making her look like she's glowing. She's got this letter in her hand, probably from Bastion, and she's lost in thought, trying to piece together his next move. Meanwhile, Bastion's night took a turn for the worse. He's caught up in this intense nightmare about a really dark moment from his childhood, finding his mom and dealing with his dad and stepmom. He wakes up sweating and just can't shake it off or get back to sleep. His doctor, Dr. Kramer, gives him some good news the next day, saying his shoulders all healed up from the surgery. The doc even jokes about Bastion being ready to jump back into action, but he's also pretty serious about not wanting to sign any papers that might send Bastion back into danger. Bastion's all chill about it cracking jokes about life's unexpected twists and adding to his collection of trophies. Dr. Kramer can't help but notice Bastion hasn't changed much since he was a kid. Speaking of the past, there was this time when this mysterious guy, Elias, showed up out of nowhere, all dramatic, talking about how messed up young Bastion was thanks to his parents. Dr. Kramer felt for the kid, especially hearing about how his dad left him high and dry. Elias was all about getting revenge and putting Bastion back on top after his mom, Sophia, died. That whole mess kicked off a feud between two families that didn't end well for anyone. Elias made sure the doctor knew exactly what was going on with Bastion, all the crazy training and accidents from trying to live up to being the heir. Despite Elias' efforts to call out Bastion's dad for being too harsh, the old man always had an excuse, saying it was all part of the training. He even remarried and had another kid to throw people off the scent. 
Young Bastion's life was intense up before dawn, tackling tough studies, then straight into hardcore training, roaming the woods alone at night. It was a lot for anyone, let alone a kid. Dr. Kramer can't help but get a bit nostalgic when he thinks about the first time he met Bastion. The kid was only six, and Dr. Kramer was there for him all the way up until he turned 12, during those tough years under Claus's roof. There's a part of him that feels a bit guilty about having to break the news to Bastion about his mom when he was so young. But then, as Bastion waves goodbye, Dr. Kramer is left alone with his thoughts. Switching gears, we find ourselves outside Sabine's clothes store, and guess who's heading in? Yep, our leading lady, Odette. She's a bit taken aback to find Bastion there, but he doesn't waste any time getting her inside. Madame Hilda Sabine, the store's owner, is all smiles, especially when she sees Odette walk through the door. She's straight to business, though, wondering if they should talk money first or just dive into fitting Odette. And Odette? She's already bracing herself for this moment, her surprise barely concealed. Odette quickly makes it clear she's not here to shop, her tone soft yet assertive. Bastion catches on that things are heating up and asks Madame Sabine for some privacy to chat with Odette. Once Madame Sabine steps out, Odette doesn't hold back, calling out Bastion for not giving her a heads up about their destination. Bastion tries to smooth things over, mentioning the favor his aunt pulled to get this appointment. Odette, though, is having none of it, making it clear she's not interested in accepting any gifts from him. Bastion's a bit puzzled by her reaction, especially when she accuses him of forcing presents on her. Bastion, trying to lighten the mood, brings up the not-so-flattering nickname the upper class has given her, Beggar Princess. Odette gives him this weary look, but Bastion's on a mission. He declares, in his most knightly fashion, that he's going to make sure everyone knows she's with him. He's worried about the gossip and the side-eyes if she's not dressed to the nines, which only confirms Odette's suspicions about the whole arrangement. Despite the rumors and potential hit to his reputation, Bastion's all about keeping his honor intact though he admits that money's a different story altogether. He's musing over his wine, pondering life's luxuries, and just wishing Odette would play along. Odette, for her part, can't stand the thought of anyone looking down on Bastion. She tries to explain she's not all that bothered by the situation, asking him not to overthink it. Bastion, though, isn't ready to drop it. He brings up his own humble beginnings, saying there's not much he can do about that unless he gets a do-over in life. Odette jumps in, saying that's not what she meant, but Bastion's already moving on, suggesting they focus on what they can fix. Madame Sabine comes back into the room, ready to get started on Odette's measurements. As she begins, she's genuinely impressed by Odette's figure. Right from the moment Odette walked in, Madame Sabine could tell she had a great body, but now, seeing it up close, she's even more amazed. She muses to herself that Odette probably hasn't had the chance to explore her fashion sense, given her background, but she's struck by Odette's natural grace and poise, even with the assistant around. It starts to click for Madame Sabine why Bastion is so taken with her, there's definitely something special about Odette. After finishing the measurements, Madame Sabine tells Odette she'll need a bit of time to find the perfect dress that captures her essence. Left in the dressing room, Odette feels a chill and realizes she doesn't have anything to keep warm. Madame Sabine suggests using a blanket from the main room. Bastion, trying to be respectful, hands over the blanket without making it awkward and promises he's not trying to sneak a peek. Odette wraps herself up, a bit puzzled by Bastion's serious demeanor. Once they're outside, Bastion tells Odette that Hans will take her home in the carriage. He explains he's got a short walk to his next destination and advises her to drop off her clothes at the Triaga first, to avoid any issues with her father. Odette agrees, and with a quick goodbye, Bastion heads off. Back at Bastion's place, the evening takes an unexpected turn when Princess Isabel surprises him with a visit, saying she just wanted to see him. Her arrival throws Bastion off, especially when she insists on staying, despite his attempts to send her back to the palace. She's frustrated, feeling overlooked and desperate to be seen as more than just a child in his eyes. She makes a dramatic plea, willing to give up everything, even her title, for a chance with him, Bastion, however, is not having any of it. He's tired of these games and calls her out, especially reminding her of how poorly she treated Odette. Despite Isabel's attempts to appeal to their past connection, Bastion remains firm, stating his loyalty lies with the military and the royal family, not with personal attachments. The night ends with a tense standoff, 
both of them waiting for the inevitable arrival of the palace guards. So, just as things are getting pretty heated between Al, the palace guards show up out of nowhere, inquiring about the whereabouts of the princess. Bastion explains that she showed up at his place, but since they were there now, he'll just head to bed. But nope, the guards have other plans. They're like, actually, you need to come with us back to the palace, pronto. Orders from the top. Switching gears, we catch up with Odette and her sister Kira, who's all kinds of excited. She's bouncing around, asking Odette if she'd take her to the amusement park. Odette, being the cool sister she is, says yes and even sets a date for it. Tira's over the moon, giving Odette the biggest hug from behind, and Odette? She's just soaking in the moment, thinking about how this tutoring gig she saw could really help them out financially. It pays way better than she expected. Her mind starts to wander to Bastion and his random acts of kindness, but she quickly snaps back to reality, reminding herself he's off limits since he's practically engaged. Meanwhile, Tira's already planning her outfit for the amusement park day. As they're chilling, Odette kinda lets slip about her dream of moving to a coastal town after graduation, starting fresh. Tira throws out the idea of just moving to a new house instead, but Odette's all about the practicalities, like how expensive city living is. Tira heads off to bed, leaving Odette lost in thoughts about the future, picturing Tira all grown up. Then, out of the blue, Tira mentions this guy named Claus, and Odette's like, hold up, where did you hear that name? Tira's clueless, just repeating something their dad mentioned about Claus and money. Odette's mind starts racing with worry, grabbing her coat and heading out into the night, despite Tira's confusion about her sudden departure. Meanwhile, over at the Imperial Palace, Bastion's having a rough time. He's standing there, probably trying to explain the Isabel situation, when the queen just loses it. She slaps him right across the face, accusing him of messing with the royal family and basically telling him he's nothing without the palace's backing. The emperor steps in, trying to dial down the tension, reminding the queen to keep her cool. Despite her anger, she backs down, but not without shooting some serious glares Bastion's way. Right after the queen steps out, the emperor lets out this huge sigh. He's got some news to drop, turns out, the princess is leaving tomorrow and won't be back until she's all settled down. The reason? The emperor wants her to chill out and focus on her health before the big wedding. Bastion's just nodding along, taking in everything the emperor's saying. But then, the emperor tries to connect the dots between the princess sneaking off to Bastion's place, but honestly, he's got nothing solid. The emperor then spills that he had someone keep an eye on Bastion all day. And what do they find? Bastion's been sneaking around with Sandrine. It's a bit of a shocker, but hey, at least Bastion's got connections, being involved with the Heinesburg's niece and all. Yet, the Emperor can't help feeling a bit relieved that Bastion's not mixed up in his daughter's latest drama. Not one to keep his thoughts to himself, the Emperor starts probing about Bastion's other possible love interests. Bastion's like, just say the word, and I'm on it, ready to do whatever the Emperor asks. The Emperor checks if Bastion's really up for anything, and Bastion's all in, which seems to please the Emperor. They switch to speaking their own language, keeping things on the down low. Bastion's about to leave when the Emperor brings up the whole Prince Belov and Princess Isabel situation, hinting it's a big deal. Bastion reassures him, but the Emperor lays it on thick about how serious things are and that he'd never forgive Bastion if things went south. I'll head to the front line if I have to, Bastion says, showing he's all in for the Imperial family. But the Emperor throws another curveball, telling him to hurry up and get married, which totally catches Bastion off guard. Meanwhile, Odette's on the night train, lost in her thoughts about a chat she had with Robies and all the missed chances to see Bastion. She steps off the bus, feeling the cold night air, and her mind's just spinning with memories of her last meet-up with Bastion all the gifts, the special treatment, and his reluctance to keep playing pretend. She's caught up in this whirlwind of thoughts as she heads into her apartment building. Suddenly, she notices her neighbor looking super annoyed. The neighbor's all about some drama upstairs needing Odette's attention. Odette's already tired of the constant bickering between her dad and sister and kinda wishes she could just vanish for a bit. But she snaps back to reality and rushes upstairs, only to find her dad and Tira fighting over their savings box. Tira's yelling at him to let go, but then her dad announces he's taking over and slaps Tira. That sets Tira off, and she pushes him so hard he tumbles down the stairs and ends up bleeding on the floor. Odette's just standing there, 
completely shocked, yelling, Dad. So, Bastion and the Emperor are still going at it in the palace. The Emperor, with a bit of advice from the Empress, tells Bastion straight up that he needs to get his act together and tie the knot before the summer festival kicks off. He's pretty open about it, even suggesting Bastion could run off with Sandrine if he wanted, but deep down, he's rooting for Odette. The conversation gets real intense when the Emperor, staring deeply into Bastion's eyes, lays down the law, Bastion's got to stay hedged for at least two years, just until Princess Isabel is happily married off to Belov and starts a family. Bastion's totally thrown off by this sudden deadline, we're talking less than two months away, but the Emperor isn't having any of it. Do it now, he says. It's either that or worse. He also wants Bastion to play the part of the perfect husband, all to keep Prince Bella from feeling insecure, considering Bastion's past with Isabel. Bastion isn't exactly thrilled by the idea, but the Emperor promises him pretty much anything he wants if he pulls this off. Cut to the next day, and we're outside City Rats' hospital where Odette and Tira are having a major moment. Tira's freaking out, thinking she might end up in jail for what happened to their dad. But Odette's quick to calm her down, explaining their dad was too drunk to remember anything, and it was just an accident. Tira's scared someone might have seen what happened, but Odette's all about protecting her sister, insisting it was self-defense, and there's no way Tira's going to hell for that. Meanwhile, Bastion's in his carriage, lost in thought. The Emperor's orders are weighing on him heavily, especially with the summer festival just around the corner. He's got only a few days to pick a bride and get married, sticking to the plan for two years to meet the Emperor's conditions. Thinking about Sandrine, he figures they're both in a similar boat, needing to wait two years for different reasons. Just two years, he tells himself, thinking this might just work out. He's confident that with the right amount of cash, he can convince any lady to join him in this arrangement. Bastion's head is spinning with thoughts, and right at the center of this whirlwind is Odette. He can't help but think she's the best choice for this whole marriage scheme, even as he rubs his temple, trying to make sense of it all. When Robies walks in, he can tell Bastion's not his usual self and throws a concerned are you okay, his way. But Bastion's mind is miles away from any headache, he's got bigger fish to fry. He tells Robies, pretty much straight up, that they need to get Odette over here, pronto. Before Robies can make a move, though, he mentions a visitor from the night before, keeping things on the down low as Bastion wanted. He hands over a letter from the mystery guest, and Bastion quickly scans it, relieved that she's in the loop. But wait, there's more another letter, this time from Countess Trier. Bastion reads it with a furrowed brow, learning about Odette's dad and his serious health scare. He tells Robies it's time to have a chat with Odette, face to face. Switching scenes, we find Odette in a bit of a daze, sitting by her father's bedside. She's startled when Countess Trier checks in on her, worried about her pulling an all-nighter. Trier knows Odette's not one to back down easily but still urges her to catch some ZS. Outside, Odette tries to rest, but her mind's racing with worries about her dad and their future. That's when Bastion shows up, offering sympathy but getting straight to business. He hands her a revised contract and waits for her reaction. Odette's not impressed, scoffing at the idea of being bought for two years. Bastion expected as much, but frames it as a job offer instead. He's on a tight schedule, thanks to the Emperor, and lays it out for Odette, she's his top pick, but he's got options if she's not on board. Then he drops the bomb about her dad's condition and the struggles with their apartment. He sees the worry in her eyes and tries to ease her fears, explaining that this marriage is more about appearances for the public than anything else. Odette gives the contract another read, weighing her options. The benefits are tempting, especially thinking about the best care for her dad and a bright future for Tira. It's a lot to consider for just two years of her life. Then, out of nowhere, she asks about Bastion's plans with Sandrine post-contract, apologizing for overhearing a conversation once. Bastion answers, and she probes further about the seriousness of the Emperor's deal. She asks for a day to think it over, but Bastion reminds her time is of the essence. In a surprising turn, Odette grabs the pen and signs the contract before Bastion can even process what's happening. And just when you think you've got a handle on things, she faints, collapsing right into Bastion's arms. In the next scene, Odette wakes up feeling kind of out of it and realizes pushing Bastion away is a no-go because, honestly, she's just in too much pain. Cut to Bastion, who's chatting up a nurse, dropping the news that he's planning a quick visit to Dr. Kramer's clinic. 
The nurse is like, uh, you know he doesn't usually see just anyone, right? But Bastion, being Bastion, simply says, tell him it's Bastion Claus's fiancé. Smooth. Next up, we've got this scene where Countess Trier, who's all about that independent vibe, is talking about how she's gearing up for a wedding. This is totally new territory for her. Odette's there, listening to all this, and can't help but throw in a big thank you. Countess Trier, ever the Joker, cracks a line about how she loves the chance to splash some cash, especially since Lieutenant Claus wants his fiancé to be the belle of the ball. She's given it her best shot. Odette's feeling a bit overwhelmed with all the fancy gifts and the cash bastions dropping on the wedding, but when Countess Trier jokes about how loaded Bastion is, they both end up laughing. Looking out the window, Odette's mind wanders to her dad, who's now getting top-notch care at a fancy hospital, and Tira, who's about to hit up one of the best schools around. She's kind of soaking in the moment, thinking about how soon she'll be stepping into a new chapter, all by herself. Switching scenes, Bastion's family is all kinds of fired up, wondering how on earth he's managed to stack up so much wealth. His brother's calling him nuts for wanting to spend his honeymoon at their new summer house. He's eyeing Bastion's places, trying to figure out what's up with their locations and how they're pretty much opposites. Bastion then drops some thoughts on everyone, talking about how there's this perfume that's still got a hold on his heart. He throws a bit of shade at his folks, thanking them for the memories, but you can tell he's not all warm and fuzzy about it. His brother scratching his head, figuring Bastion must have hit some sort of jackpot, given their granddad's antique biz isn't exactly booming. He's puzzled why Bastion would choose the soldier life over an easy ride. Bastion then has a moment with his dad, hinting that the Claus family's image could use a bit of polishing, hoping it'll reflect better on the whole city. And just like that, he walks off, leaving his dad to ponder. As Bastion makes his way back, he bumps into Princess Sandrine, who looks like she's been through the ringer, questioning how Bastion could go and get hitched without giving her a heads up. Bastion's quick to fire back, saying he thought she'd be busy, plus he chatted with her dad about the whole situation. Sandrine's heartbroken, not just because Bastion went to her dad first, but because it dawns on her that maybe Bastion's more into her family's wealth and connections than anything else. However, he doesn't hide the fact that her dad's connections are a big plus for him, but hey, it's not a one-way street, her dad's looking to make a profit too. So, they're on even ground, each bringing something to the table. Bastion drops a hint that maybe, just maybe, there's a future for them once his current royal entanglements are sorted out. Sandrine's important to him, no doubt, but he's got baggage, and if she's not down for that ride, well, it might be time for her to look elsewhere. As Bastion walks away, leaving Sandrine in tears, the clock's ticking down to his wedding. Fast forward, and it's wedding day. Odette's looking stunning, and Bastion's not too shabby himself. The moment's all kinds of emotional, especially for Odette, who's trying to wrap her head around marrying the guy who, not so long ago, seemed like a transaction. Now, as they stand there, ready to seal the deal with a kiss, she's hit by the reality of their situation, this is her life for the next two years. The reception's kicking off, and Bastion's got this look in his eyes as he asks Odette if she's happy. Confused, she slips up and calls him captain, but he's quick to correct her. They dive into this heart-to-heart -heart about the house, their future, and what's expected of them. Bastion's laying down the law, weekends only for him due to work, and oh, by the way, no family visits, please. Odette's mind goes back to something Countess Trier said, but before she can get too lost in thought, Bastion's nudging her to smile for the cameras. As they pose for the perfect photo op, Odette can't help but drop one last bomb, what's the plan if everything's still smooth sailing after two years? Bastion flips the question back to her, leaving her to ponder their future. Cut to Odette living her best princess life, though not without a side of shade from the maids gossiping about her. Amidst the whispers, she throws out a casual bet about whether they'll have a boy or a girl, with a cheeky nod to finding out this winter. Despite the gossip, it's clear she's settling into her new role, controversies and all. So, there's this buzz going around that Odette's only hanging on to Bastion because she's pregnant, and her maid's kinda thrown off by Odette's blunt chat about it. Odette's like, oops, my bad, feeling a tad guilty for putting her maid in such an awkward convo. She tries to smooth things over, but when the maid goes on defense mode, Odette's quick to set things straight, she's jumping into this gossip fest since subtlety's flown out the window. Odette's doing her best not to let the gossip get to her, but hey, she's only human. 
There's only so much whispering one can take, especially when it's happening right under your nose. She decides to have a little chat with her maid Dora, pointing out a few slip-ups and making it clear she's not looking for a repeat performance during her first two years of marriage. Later that night, Dora pops in to give Odette the lowdown on some guests and checks if she needs anything else. Odette's grateful for the help, sending Dora off with a thanks as she heads to her bedroom. This room's something else, decked out with all sorts of fancy stuff, and Odette's still pinching herself, wondering if this is really her life now. She's lost in thoughts about what her mom would say, when suddenly, the door creaks open and in walks Bastion, catching her totally off guard. She's like, what are you doing here? And he's all, technically, this is my room. Odette reminds him of their marriage contract's fine print about keeping up appearances only at official dose, but Bastion doesn't miss a beat. He pulls her into a hug, leaving her heart doing somersaults, curious about his next move. After a tense moment, Bastion lets go and signals for her to follow him. They sneak through a side door, and he opens up another room, explaining the mix-up about the bedroom situation. Odette's relieved and agrees to keep the maids in the dark about the real deal with their marriage. She slips up again, calling him captain, and he corrects her, probably for the millionth time. He drops a hint about her playing hostess down the line but then leaves her to digest everything. Cut to this swanky building called Rat's Center, where the big money moves happen. Bastion's chilling in this opulent setting when an older guy in a suit comes in, ready to update him via text on some business stuff. But Bastion's all about face-to-face -face updates, especially when it comes to wrapping up loose ends that the council needs to know about. This Thomas Miller guy, CEO and Bastion's mentor, is super curious about why Bastion's showing up early, clearly more interested in the juicy details of Bastion's personal life than anything else. Bastion kicks off the chat with Thomas Miller by diving into what could have been, his original plan was all about taking the company public right after tying the knot with Sandrine. But, you know, life throws a curveball sometimes, and the Emperor had other ideas. So, with that plan on the back burner, Bastion shifts gears to talk strategy. He's all about making sure they're ready to jump on opportunities without skipping a beat. Thomas leans back, a bit reflective, mulling over how it feels when folks don't take your business seriously. He's been there, done that, starting from scratch to build something that would make his granddad proud. Bastion gives props to Thomas for being the rock the company needed, especially after they hit the refresh button. But hey, they both know this journey's far from over. It's going to be a climb. Meanwhile, in another part of town, the vibe's shifting. Nobility's not what it used to be. If you're not bringing something to the table, you're out. It's a new era, skills and smarts over lineage. The game's changing, and those who adapt are the ones who'll reign. Switching scenes, we find Odette getting hands-on with her maids, fine-tuning dinner plans. Life's been a whirlwind of socials and managing a mansion. Time's flying, and before she knows it, the weekend rolls around, and Bastion's due for a visit. Odette's all grace and poise, welcoming Bastion home. They meet up, doing their best impression of a couple madly in love, but once they're away from prying eyes, it's back to reality. Bastion's still holding on to her hand, playing his part even as Odette tells him to cut it out. He's curious about her choice of bling for the evening, hinting at the high-profile guests waiting downstairs. Enter Sandrine, Bastion's plus one, thanks to a last-minute change. Odette tries to keep it cool, but Sandrine's not hiding her envy, especially when she spots Odette's necklace. She's convinced Odette's got Bastion wrapped around her finger. Dinner's going smoothly, with Bastion's friends throwing compliments left and right, easing Odette into the vibe. Just then, Robies leans in, whispering about some urgent work, excusing himself and leaving the table buzzing with conversation. So, Eric decides to get all chatty with Odette about her dad, which kinda rubs her the wrong way. But then, Sandrine can't help but dive deeper into the whole backstory of that wild night. Odette knows full well they're judging her, but she spills it anyway. She talks about how her dad was big into gambling, to the point where he actually bet his daughter. Yeah, you heard that right. And the officers, including her now husband and his crew, didn't back down from the challenge. She shares how that crazy night was actually the first time she met her husband. He ended up winning the bet but, in a move of sheer class, let her go because he's that honorable. And honestly, Odette can't help but feel thankful for how decent he and his friends were to her. Sandrine tries to play the jealous card, dropping some snarky love comment. 
And just when things couldn't get more awkward, Sandrine starts bombarding Odette with questions. Odette's at a loss for words until her husband steps in, laying down the truth about the whole betting situation. Like something out of a fairy tale, he goes in for this passionate kiss, leaving Sandrine steaming and their friends cheering. Odette's left there, kind of shell-shocked by the whole display, and even more peeped that Sandrine's just disrespecting her left and right, hinting she might know Odette's big secret. Lucas jumps into the convo, curious about their house's location, and Bastion's like, oh, my wife digs the quiet, making it sound like Odette doesn't really have a say in it. And there's Odette, trying to process being in this wild setup, feeling like she's been thrust into this role without much of a choice. Next thing you know, Odette and Sandrin are roaming this huge hallway after dinner. Sandrin throws a thanks Odette's way for the meal but quickly shifts gears, wanting to explore the house instead of sticking to some snooze fest tea party. She's all over the place, stopping dead in her tracks at a painting, making some comment about Bastion having his work cut out for him. Odette agrees, hinting that the place is still a work in progress. Without missing a beat, Sandrin barges into a room, making herself right at home on a couch and launching into this whole spiel about art. She's got opinions, alright, going on about what she hates and loves in art, and then starts telling Odette what she should hang on the walls. Honestly, Odette's probably wondering if Sandrin even gets what she's talking about. In a twist, Odette extends an invite to the ceremony, but Sandrin flips the script, claiming Bastion's embarrassed by her. And then, bam, she drops the bomb about Odette being hired for two years, like some sort of twisted reality show plot twist come to life. Sandrin's having a field day, laughing up a storm at the whole act Odette and Bastion have going on. But then, she switches gears real quick, getting all serious and warning Odette about not getting pregnant, because apparently, that's where Sandrin draws the line. That night, as Odette gets ready for bed, her mind's all over the place. She's replaying the day's events with Sandrin and thinking about how this house will eventually be hers. But then, she can't help but dwell on Sandrin's harsh words, calling her out in a way that was both rude and uncalled for. Mid-thought, Bastion's voice breaks through, pulling her back to reality. As he walks towards her, he suddenly stops short, realizing Odette's in her undergarments. Confused by his reaction, she calls him out on it, prompting him to look away while she quickly grabs her robe. Sitting down together, Bastion dives into this talk about how marrying a commoner makes her one too, which Odette already knows. He tells her to drop the noble lady act and embrace her new commoner status, which kinda throws her for a loop. She's been feeling like she's just playing a role to meet his expectations, and now he's asking her to change her script again. Odette pushes back, saying she'll do her thing regardless of his opinions. The tension ramps up as she declares she won't let any title define her, she's her own person first and foremost. They go back and forth a bit, with Bastion admitting he finds her irresistibly beautiful, which only irritates Odette more. Despite his feelings, Bastion reminds himself, and Odette, that this is all temporary, and he intends to come out on top, no matter what it takes. The next day, Odette's keeping busy, ordering paintings and enjoying some rare alone time since Bastion's swamped with work. She's planning a chill weekend, maybe stopping by a cafe and picking up a book. While checking out the artwork, she falls hard for one painting, only to find out it's already been bought by her own family, no less, as Franz appears on the scene. Meanwhile, Bastion's preoccupied with his business agenda, heading back to the company when he spots Odette at Rats, totally unexpected. And to top it off, Franz is there, getting out of the same carriage as Odette. Bastion's mind is racing, trying to figure out what's going on between them. Taking it back a bit, we learn that Odette and Franz bumped into each other at the gallery. They exchange pleasantries when out of the blue, Franz gets curious about why Odette's eyeing this painting. She's straight up about it, saying it's just gorgeous. Franz sees his chance and dives deep into convo mode. He starts talking about how some folks criticize the piece, mentioning it's why the artist isn't exactly a household name. Odette, though, she's got her own take. She's all about appreciating art from a traditional lens but gets that beauty's in the eye of the beholder. They get into this chill chat about the artwork, even roping in Linzer for a bit of banter. Linzer, being the gossip he is, spills that Franz is this big shot art collector around rats. Talk about convenient, right? But Linzer doesn't miss a chance to mention Franz's art smarts which apparently make him a tad impulsive, but hey, he's not a bad guy. Franz, living up to the gentleman title, suggests Odette should grab the painting, hoping it'll get the recognition it deserves someday. 
Even though he was keen on it, he steps back, letting Odette have her moment with the art. And just when you think that's that, Franz is like, how about tea? Classic move. Meanwhile, Bastion's lurking around, spotting his brother and Odette having their little art world chat. He's scratching his head, wondering what they're on about. Watching them, he sees Franz hand Odette a note before taking off. Odette takes a seat, looking all thoughtful, and Bastion decides to join her. They get into this heart-to-heart, -heart, or more like a mini-squabble. Odette's keeping her cool, while Bastion's trying to figure out what's ticking inside her head. They manage to simmer down and head off to the car. Driving to some fancy event, Odette's lost in thought about their past arguments, especially the one about Bastion working for her. It's still a puzzle she's trying to solve. Arriving at the venue, Bastion drops this wisdom nugget about winning at all costs, earning a smile from Odette. Together, they step into the ceremony, doing the whole meet and greet thing. Xander's Claus kicks off with a speech about his daughter, and while the ladies are buzzing about him, Odette can't help but notice the stark difference between him and Bastion. Later, Bastion's not feeling great, so he sends Odette off to the guest bedroom. After a bit, he checks in on her, thinking she's off to dreamland. Surprise, surprise, she's actually enjoying a soak in the tub. Bastion walks in, causing a near slip-up, but he's quick on the draw, helping her out. Then, they're back at it with another disagreement, this time about the whole sleeping arrangement saga. Bastion's getting heated, wants his own space since they're technically not really a couple. Mid-apology attempt, he just heads to the window, throwing it open to stare out into the night. Next scene, it's the middle of the night. Bastion is out cold, but Odette? She's wide awake, her mind racing. She's toying with the idea of just bolting, but then she pauses. What if everyone thinks she's bailing because she's not keen on getting cozy with her husband? Not wanting to deal with that drama, she slips out of bed and makes her way to the couch. There, she spends the rest of the night until the sun comes up. Morning hits, and Bastion wakes up to find the other side of the bed empty. His first thought? Oh no, not again. But instead of jumping to conclusions, he decides to do a quick sweep of the place. And there she is, crashed out on the couch. He's scratching his head, wondering how she ended up there and where the heck the blanket came from. He figures it's best not to wake her, so he scoops her up to carry her back to bed. Odette, half asleep, starts flailing about, nearly sending both of them tumbling. But Bastion? Solid as a rock, he manages to get her back to bed without any mishaps. Once there, he's all, remember your place, and she's like, what are you planning? He kinda teases her, dropping hints but then gets serious, telling her this isn't part of their agreement. Things get a bit heated, but in the end, Odette stands her ground, reminding him of their contract. Bastion backs off with a, you win this round, Odette, before leaving the room. Fast forward, and the whole gang's outside, talking about going fishing. Odette's all concerned about looking after Alma, Xander's kid, but assures everyone it'll be fine. Xander and Bastion are about to head off to fish when Bastion starts setting a brisk pace. A chaperone catches up, asking for a favor regarding Earl Genders who's tagging along despite his asthma. Bastion's like, why is he climbing then, but gets that the Earl's got his reasons. Turns out, the Earl's on a mission to collect some rare plant samples. So, they all keep moving, and soon enough, the Earl stops dead in his tracks over this tiny plant. He's over the moon, thanking the stars for this find. Bastion, meanwhile, is hit with this sense of deja vu, thinking back to Odette and their moments together. He gets lost in thought, reminiscing about their kiss, which has the others worried he might be feeling unwell. But Bastion waves it off, assuring them he's just fine. Odette's out there, just soaking up the wilderness, her mind doing somersaults over this whole contract marriage drama. She's replaying that morning, remembering how Bastion almost crossed a line he promised he wouldn't. Then, her thoughts drift to something the princess mentioned at the ball, making her feel a bit down because Bastion might see her in a not-so-great light too. Trying to shake off these vibes, she casually tosses a stone into a nearby stream before deciding to pick some flowers, spotting a rare one she figures Alma would like. Kicking off her shoes, she steps into the water, aiming for the flower. But then, hello, what's this? A necklace floating by catches her eye. Just as she's about to grab it, Bastion appears out of nowhere and snags the necklace first. 
Before all this, Bastion had caught sight of Odette stepping into the stream. And let me tell you, the guy was totally smitten, he couldn't stop thinking about her. He scoops up the necklace and, playing it cool, sneaks up to whisper in her ear as he puts the necklace around her neck. In his head, he's thinking Odette can't dodge their contract situation. If she bailed without squaring things with the Emperor, she'd be in a world of trouble. It's clear Bastion's got the upper hand in their arrangement, leaving Odette feeling like she can't really call the shots. Next thing we know, Odette's back inside, eyeing the paintings on the wall, wondering if they're up to Sandrin's taste. She's reflecting on her time at Demel's place, thinking about Bastion's wild side from card games to late-night escapades. There's a part of her that appreciates seeing this raw side of him, not just the good husband act. She ponders over all the moments she pushed away his attempts to be nice, like in the bathroom and bedroom, curious about what might have happened if she hadn't resisted. She decides it's best not to rock the boat and to just play along to keep things smooth for the rest of their marriage. Her thoughts get interrupted by Dora, who's all excited about the new furniture for the solarium arriving. Odette heads over and is taken aback by this stunning golden piano sitting there. Did my husband buy this? She wonders out loud. A suited guy nearby fills her in on how trendy it is to have a piano in the solarium these days, chatting her up about the beauty of music as she tests out the keys. Later that night, Bastion's hunched over his mini business map, plotting his next move in the gaming industry, his mind wandering back to a chat with the guard about the Emperor's concerns over their living situation. It's all a big act, a deception dance they're doing. Just then, Robies pops in with a message from Odette, who wants to head to Rats for some piano sheet music, mentioning the piano Bastion ordered has arrived at their summer villa. Bastion can't help but smile, glad to see her showing interest in something since their fishing trip, especially since she's been avoiding eye contact with him. He tells Robies to arrange a lunch with the Navy at 12, happy to see her finding some joy amidst their complicated setup. So, there's Odette, chilling at their meetup spot way too early and feeling a tad bit miffed about it. Then, out of the blue, Sandrin pops up, doing her best impression of Captain Obvious, pointing out that Odette seems to be waiting for someone. Odette, ever the polite one, throws a casual hey Sandrin's way. But Sandrin's got plans, hinting she wants to play matchmaker or something. Odette's not having any of it, though. She hits Sandrin with a polite have a nice day and makes it clear she's ready to dodge whatever curveball Sandrin's planning to throw. But Sandrin? She's like a dog with a bone, starting to whine about Odette being all high and mighty. Odette cuts her off mid-rant, laying down the law. She's like, listen, I'm Bastion's wife, you're Leonard's problem, and if I want to be blunt, I will. She also throws in a little reminder for Sandrin to keep her drama to herself, especially since she's still hung up on snagging a title that's clearly not hers. Odette's stance is pretty clear, she's not about to let Sandrin's antics slide without a fight. She even goes as far as warning Sandrin to get used to it unless she changes her tune around Bastion. Their back and forth has Sandrin shooting daggers with her eyes. If looks could kill, right? Sandrin storms off, muttering something about Odette having a long way to head. Just then, she's off to catch Bastion at his office, but Lucas stops her with news that Bastion's been called to the Imperial Palace, stat. Sandrin's visibly bummed because she's been itching to see Bastion and had this whole lunch date planned with her cousin, Lucas. Curiosity gets the better of her, and she ditches the lunch plan, promising Lucas they'll do it another time. She's determined to catch up with Bastion before he heads off to the palace. As she exits the palace, she spots Bastion and his bodyguard by the carriage. Complaining of feeling unwell, she's invited to hop in for a ride. Meanwhile, inside the carriage, Bastion catches a glimpse of Odette waiting outside, remembering he promised to visit her. He's internally fuming, wishing the carriage could just sneak by silently. But Sandrin's secretly thrilled, hoping Odette sees them together and gets a taste of jealousy. And sure enough, as they pass by, Odette spots them. Sandrin's smug look doesn't go unnoticed, stirring a mix of jealousy and confusion in Odette. She's left wondering why Bastion would set up a meeting only to bail on her for Sandrin. Little does she know, this was Sandrin's plan all along. Meanwhile, Bastion's caught off guard by Odette's jealous reaction, pondering if maybe, just maybe, she's got feelings for him but is playing it cool. She decides to hit up the coffee shop where Bastion had set up a little rendezvous for the two of them. She's there, kinda antsy, looking around in hopes of spotting him. 
But here's the thing, Bastion's all tied up at the Imperial Palace, doing his best to wrap things up quick. He's there, practically on the edge of his seat, urging everyone to get a move on because he's got plans with his wife, Odette, and he doesn't want to keep her waiting. Back at the coffee shop, Odette's sitting solo, and a waiter swings by, checking if she wants something to sip on while she waits. She's like, nah, hold off for now. My husband's supposed to join me. You can just feel the anticipation brewing between them, even though they're not in the same room. Meanwhile, Bastion's patience is running thin at the palace. He finally decides, you know what? Let's hit pause on this meeting. He's got Odette on his mind and unfinished business to attend to, namely, making sure he doesn't stand her up. So, he makes his exit, all set to dash over to the coffee shop and catch up with Odette. The love story between Odette and Bastion is just getting to its peak. Stay tuned for season 2. In the meantime, do check out other interesting stories on the channel. Also, please support us by liking, sharing, and subscribing. Until next time, ciao!